Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Chris Adams. I'm the online community manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled The Use Case Technique and Overview. Today's featured speaker is Carl Wiegers from Process Impact. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the Q&A session at the end, so be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the GoToWebinar software. I'd like to say thank you to Global Knowledge for sponsoring this event. And at this time, I will turn it over to Michael Stierhoff, Senior Product Manager at Global Knowledge, to say a few words before we get started. Thank you, Chris. Hello, I'm Michael Stierhoff with Global Knowledge. You might be aware of us as the global standard for technology training, but from the slide, you can see that we offer a broad range of business analysis courses. We partner with Cisco, IBM, Red Hat, Microsoft on the um, uh, certifications that you would expect, ranging from cloud to network certification on the technology side. But on the business side, we have business analysis, idle project management, and then all the core skills that you need in the modern organizations to keep up with leadership, communications, finance, all to give you the advantage to expand that skill set to get closer to the business and the customer. Um, and we'll, at the end, come back and talk about the salary study and how it impacts you and your organization. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing your thoughts and handing over to Carl. Thank you, Michael. Greetings from Portland, Oregon. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this slide shows my contact information. I invite you to visit my website, processimpact.com. For example, you might want to visit the goodies page there where you can download a wide variety of templates and other useful work aids. This slide shows some of the books that I've written. I'll say a, a bit more about some of those in just a minute. The one on the right side is uh, kind of interesting. Pearls from Sand is a memoir of life lessons. It was fun to write something completely different from my software books a couple of years ago. Um, I've been writing also a uh, consulting tips and tricks blog that you see there uh, toward the bottom of the slide. And even if you're not a consultant, there's a lot of good information there about topics like writing and giving presentations that you might find useful. I've been thinking about how to improve requirements practices on software projects for just about 30 years now. Uh, I became a fan of the use case technique and related methods when I applied it with great success on a project called the chemical tracking system that I worked on when I was at Kodak. So what I'd like to do today is share with you some of the things that I've learned about use cases, some of the things that confuse people, and some of the basic techniques that you can use to help them be a valuable contributor to your requirements elicitation activities. Uh, there's some good information about these in various books. Um, this is my most recent book, Software Requirements 3rd Edition, co-authored with Joy Beatty, which came out uh, in 2013. And it's got a pretty hefty chapter on uh, user requirements focusing on use cases. Uh, another book I wrote is called More About Software Requirements, cleverly titled by the author, I, or by the uh, publisher. I had a better title, but sometimes the publisher wins. And that book is also uh, kind of a special topics book that has several chapters that deal with some of the particularly difficult issues around uh, use cases that just, they're, they're not really difficult, but they cause confusion for lots of people. So that tries to clarify some of those. Now, a very wise person once said, if you read one book on use cases, you're in good shape. If you read two, you're in trouble. And his point was that the use cases have been evolving over time, and the writers in the field don't all agree on vocabulary and conventions, even though they agree on the broad strokes. And I'm not going to present a wacky new approach, you know, Carl's crazy new ideas about use cases, but rather a mainstream approach shaped by my own experiences that I think uh, people would find practical in most situations. But if you were to read one book on use cases, this is the one I would recommend, Use Cases, Requirements, and Context by Kulak and Guiney. Uh, I think that overall that is the, the most balanced and most practical uh, book on the topic. But if you wanted something a little more concise, then I'd, I'd point you toward the top couple of books that I showed here. So here's what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, hour or so. First, I'm going to uh, define what I mean by use cases. I can't tell you everything there is to know about use cases in this brief presentation, just give you a, a solid overview of the method. But I do have a nice e-learning class called Exploring User Requirements with Use Cases that you can access and learn about from the e-learning page at processimpacts.com. So we'll start with a definition or two, and it's always a good idea to get us on a common terminology footing. 
Um, so many of you are probably familiar with the idea of user stories from the Agile community, so I'll show you my view of how use cases and user stories relate. I'll describe some of the reasons why I think this is such a powerful technique for requirement solicitation, some of the benefits of taking a usage-centric as opposed to a product or feature-centric approach to requirement specification. And this technique applies this concept regardless of whether you're using use cases or user stories, it doesn't matter. They're both usage-centric techniques. Another area that uh, comes up when we're talking about use cases is the idea of actors and user classes. So I'll describe those and show you how they fit together. This is one of those points of confusion that people often encounter. I'm going to describe to you just very briefly how I actually approached uh, using use cases on this chemical tracking system back at Kodak because to me it really illustrated a on a good application of a collaborative elicitation workshop and basically the way that you can employ use cases as a technique to structure the conversation you have with users when you're trying to understand their needs. I'll point out the pieces of information that go into a well-structured use case and finally talk about another common point of confusion which is the relationship between use cases and functional requirements. Now whenever I'm talking with somebody about requirements, the very first thing I usually have to do is establish some common terminology. I could show each of you one requirement statement and you're going to call it many different things. One of you might look at that and say, oh that's a, a software requirement, a user requirement. Somebody else says it's a business requirement or a system requirement or a functional requirement, a user story, uh, a feature, a constraint. So we have this huge tower of Babel problem, terminology problem. So what I'm going to do is very briefly describe to you a three-level model that I have found helpful for a long time to help deal with the fact that there are many different kinds of information that we call the requirements. And this really points to the need to be able to put some adjectives in front of the word requirements so that we can distinguish one type of information to another. Now there's a saying about models. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. And this is absolutely true for this one as well. This is certainly not a complete correct picture of the world of requirements. It's a simplification, but I find it to be helpful and I hope you will as well. So at the top level are the business requirements. And people again use that term to mean different things, but when I say business requirements, I'm talking about really a kind of why information. Why are we undertaking the project? How will the world be better in some way if this product is in it in terms of both customer and business benefits? And that's really where we have to start. We have to understand the business objectives for, for the project. Otherwise, how do you have any idea of whether you've achieved the desired outcomes? And we need to store that information someplace. And I like to store it in something I call a vision and scope document. Templates for these various documents are available on the goodies page at processimpact.com. Now, I call it a document, but really it's just a container of information. And you can store that in a, a variety of of uh, forms ranging from you know, index cards to an Excel spreadsheet to a traditional word processing document to the database of requirements management tool. I don't care how you store it, but this represents a certain chunk of information that describes the business perspective of why we're undertaking the project. But that's not an inf enough information for a developer to know what to build. So we need to go down to another level. Uh, this is the level of user requirements. And in this diagram, the solid arrow means is stored in. So business requirements are stored in a vision and scope document. The dashed arrows mean lead to or influence or are derived from. Okay? So based on our understanding of business requirements, we then need to understand the user requirements. And just as business requirements were a kind of why information, why are we undertaking the project, user requirements are a kind of what information. What will the user be able to do with the product? And we need to store that someplace, which we can call a user requirements document, or we can call it a use case document. But in this particular case, this is the area we're going to be focusing on uh, at this point. We're going to be focusing on the use cases at the user requirements level. That's where those fit into this model. But even that is not enough information for developers to know what to build. I have seen Many cases, I mean literally hundreds of people have told me, yeah, we wrote use cases and we gave them to the developers. The developers got the general idea, but they had a lot of questions because there was a lot of information missing. So we need to go down to another level, which are the functional requirements. You don't implement business requirements. You don't implement use cases or user stories. What you implement, if you're a developer, 
is little bits of functionality, and those function that bits of functionality let the system perform certain things under certain conditions, and that's what we really build. So we need to build the right set of functionality to let users perform the tasks and activities they need to perform that hopefully will align with achieving our uh, business objectives for the project. And we can tradition, traditionally store our functional requirements in the Software Requirement Specification, or SRS. Again, this is just a container, and you might call the, that something else, or you might store it in a, a database. That's fine. But um, the functional requirements are another kind of what information. They describe what the developer builds. So business requirements are why we're undertaking the project. User requirements that we're going to be focusing on today are what the users will be able to do with the system. And functional requirements describe what the user or what the developers will actually implement. Now there's more two requirements, of course. Uh, there are business rules. Business rules are things like policies, um, laws, regulations, industry standards, those sorts of things that certainly influence, say, who can perform a certain use case because of uh, security restrictions and privileges and things like that. We have quality attributes, a type of non-functional requirement. And in general, what I've found after reviewing hundreds of requirements documents for a lot of different clients over the years, people do a very poor job in many cases of uh, exploring and specifying quality requirements like usability and portability and security and maintainability and those kinds of things, but that's a very important part of uh, successful software development. Another category of requirements are external interface requirements that describe the connections between our system and the rest of the world, and we also have design and implementation constraints that the developers need to be aware of. So I'm showing you this model so that we can recognize that there are a wide variety of kinds of requirements information that we have to uh, classify the various information that we encounter on our project into so we can store it in the right place and people know where to find it and how to use it. But we're going to focus for today on this user requirements level. Now, use cases are not a new technique. They were developed in the 1980s, but people have been applying the related technique of user scenarios for many years. That is, trying to understand what user, users have to do with whatever software solution we're trying to design. So this is a technique that we can use to uh, capture the user level of requirements. Uh, and this is an example of a structured technique for eliciting requirements from one user or a group of users. And what we're trying to understand is not the features and functions that they want to have in our system, because that's not necessarily the right set of functionality to let people get the job done. What we need to understand is the scenarios that they envision having to perform when they use the system to do their job or to accomplish some other task. So a use case is really a discrete activity that a user needs to accomplish with the help of the system. For example, before I fly someplace, I uh, want to uh, log on to their website for the airline and uh, check in for the flight, print my boarding pass, pay any necessary fees, and that sort of thing. And so that little phrase, I want to or I need to, is a clue that you can use to tell you that whatever follows is very likely a use case, a, a thing someone needs to do, a task or a goal they have in mind when they sit down to interact with some kind of a system. So really the essence of the use case approach is that we are changing the traditional dialogue that people have often had with users or other representatives when we're exploring requirements. And, you know, the worst question you can ask when you're exploring requirements is what do you want or what do you need? The second worst question you can ask is what are your requirements? Nobody really knows how to answer those kinds of questions. And so uh, those don't lead to very useful discussions. They lead to some outpouring of more or less random information, which is probably important, but with no structure or organization to it. And the poor business analyst who's getting inundated with these random bits of knowledge isn't really too sure how to use them, where to put them, or what to do with them. So instead, with the use case approach, we're changing the focus. We were going to ask our users, tell me about some goals you wish to accomplish with the help of the system, as opposed to asking, what do you want the system to do? This is the profound issue, the profound shift in perspective that use cases and user stories provide, is that rather than focusing on the system, rather than focusing on features or a product, centric approach to requirement solicitation, we are taking a user and usage centric approach. 
tell me what you need to do and we'll collect that information and we'll use it to figure out what the system has to do to let you accomplish those things. So that I think is a much more powerful and structured way to have that conversation. So once we have that list of goals that users have in mind, those are all candidate use cases. We have to judge whether they seem to be in scope for our project and if they are, then at some point we're going to explore each of those in some detail. We're going to uh, consider that you know, an actor, for the moment an actor is a user, we'll clarify that in a little bit, but for now we'll just talk about actors as being users. So we're going to explore how the user imagines interacting with the system to accomplish that goal. Some kind of conversation or dialogue that would take place, which is a sequence of actor actions and then corresponding system responses. And once we've accomplished that conversation, hopefully you've achieved the goal and you've got some valuable outcome that you say, oh, that was great. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad I did that. Everything went fine. Thank you. From that information, we're going to derive an understanding of the functional requirements that a developer needs to implement to let that conversation take place, including the stuff that the user is going to see directly and anything that happens behind the scenes that is not apparent to the user but is part of accomplishing that task. So that's really the essence of the use case approach, but the first time I applied this on that chemical tracking system, uh, I had a big light bulb aha moment, which is I realized I could also start writing test cases from these use cases. I could start thinking about not just what do I need to build, but how would I tell if this was built correctly? So this to me was a very, very powerful insight. I realized that I can start doing testing of my software the moment after I've written my first requirement, long before I've got any executable software. And by going through this thought process, really a pair of thought processes, first uh, identifying the functional requirements we have to implement, second thinking of tests, I've now got two representations of my understanding of the system that I can compare against each other. So I'll say a bit more about that later on because this is a tremendously powerful way to find errors and ambiguities and omissions very early in your requirements process instead of after you built the software and people say, hey, wait a minute, how do I do this? Well, I can't do that. So let's find a better way to do that. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about what use cases are specifically. A use case is literally a case of usage of a system which allows the user to achieve some goal that provides value. Here's kind of a formal definition. A use case describes a sequence of interactions, that's that dialogue, between a system and an external actor, that is something outside the system boundary, that results in the actor being able to achieve some outcome of value. Now this is very important. A use case should be a standalone activity. The actor has a goal in mind, walks up to the system, interacts with it in the system in the form of a use case and achieves the goal. Any system property that doesn't describe a goal is not a use case, although it could perhaps be a part of a use case, like a step in the dialogue. And one of the traps I see people falling into very often is an attempt to force fit all of their requirements into little packages we call use cases. Now, I don't think that's at all necessary. I employ use cases to help me discover the functionality that I need to implement. But a lot of times you know about functionality anyway, you know, from some other source, from, you know, some existing system or from uh, some standard you're going to have to conform to or some business rule that uh, affects, you know, security or something like that. So the classic case that I, I use as an example here is login. I don't consider login to a system to be a use case. It provides no value. It certainly positions you as a user to then do something of value, but you're never going to walk up to an automated teller machine, put in your, your bank card, put in your PIN, log in and say, oh, thanks, that was great, and walk away. That's not your goal. Now, that's, a, that's great for the next person who walks up and you're already logged in, but that doesn't actually accomplish anything valuable for you. So just because you know of some functionality, number one, that doesn't mean it's a use case. Number two, you don't have to force it to fit into a use case. That's not the point. So a use case is not the only way to represent requirements. So use cases are employed to describe user goals, the user's view of the system, and perhaps a set of task-related activities, things that they would do in order to uh, accomplish something that's important or useful to them. But use cases do not describe user interface designs. This is another trap I've seen people step into. I've seen cases where people said, okay, so here's my use case and here's the screen. 
Well, there's just not a one-to-one -one mapping between use cases and screens. Sometimes to execute a use case, you have to go through a series of screens as part of that dialogue. Other times, a particular screen might present the user with multiple use case options that they could perform. So, so that's not a one-to-one -one thing at all. We also don't use use cases to describe the technology that's going into our solution, nor things like application architecture. That is not a part of the, uh, the use case approach. So we're focusing on an understanding of what users need to do with the system. So let me give you a few examples here, try to make this a, a little bit more tangible. Uh, some of you may be self-employed, like me, and one of the first pieces of advice I got when I um, went out as an independent consultant a long time ago was to get QuickBooks. Intuit QuickBooks is an accounting program uh, often used by small businesses. And QuickBooks has got a number of activities that you could perform. Like maybe I need to write a check for, uh, to pay some bill. Or maybe I come back from a trip and I want to enter some credit card charges for the hotel and rental car and all that kind of stuff. Uh, after I do some kind of a job for a client, I need to create an invoice. Now, did you notice that I've been saying I need to? Those are things I need to do. Those are goals I have in mind. Every time I launch QuickBooks on my computer, I'm doing it for a reason. There's something I need to do, which could be one of these things or many others. And that goal I have in mind is the use case. Uh, so I send out these invoices, and uh, every once in a while a client will actually pay me, and so I will need to go back into QuickBooks and receive that payment and put it in the right bucket and all that sort of stuff. So these are all good examples of use cases. Now, another application that we're all familiar with is, is Amazon, or really any uh, online purchasing uh, resource. And if you've ordered something from Amazon, then you get an email from them saying, oh, okay, thanks for your order, here's the order number, here's what you ordered, and here's some stuff you can do. I could check the order status. I could cancel any unshipped items that are you know, still pending. I could change the shipping op options if I decide I need to get it faster, for example, or I could track the package once it's been shipped. So these are, again, all examples of use cases, things that a user would want to do uh, for which services are provided in the software. And here on the slide, we see an illustration of someone learning how to use a credit card to make purchases online, something we should all be skilled at. Now, one of the few things that people in the use case literature all agree on is how to name them. And that's important. We want to name use cases in a way that reflects the goal that the actor is trying to accomplish from the perspective of the actor. That's important. Remember, we want the use case to describe a transaction that yields value to some actor. It shouldn't just be a step in the process. Like if you're interacting with an ATM, um, Maybe at some point you want to select the language that the ATM is going to use to talk to you. Well, that's not a use case. That's just a step in the process of, of interacting with it. So the, the name of the use case should, just, should make it clear what the valuable transaction is that we're talking about. And we also have to write these in a way that makes them general enough to cover a range of related scenarios. You know, at, at one extreme, we could have a use case that says do stuff which would encompass anything anybody ever wants to do with an application. Well, that's not very useful. That doesn't help me figure out what software to write. On the other hand, you could go down to the very, very, very lowest level of abstraction and try to list out every specific scenario anybody might ever want to do. And that doesn't help us because you'll get, you could get thousands or millions or billions or an infinite number of those. And so we need to name the use case so it covers a set of related, logically related scenarios that will basically work the same way but variations perhaps in the data or specifics. So this is the form that you want to use to name a use case. It should start with a verb. It always starts with an active verb, followed by some object and then other uh, you know, descriptors as necessary. So for example, we would say maybe I need to generate a usage report. Notice that generate is a verb. And we're describing that from the point of view of what the actor would see as being useful. You would not give that particular capability something like usage report generation, okay? That's, that's not a verb phrase, it's a noun phrase, and, and that's not consistent with use case convention. We want to try to use strong, clear, explicit verbs. Uh, you want to avoid vague verbs like manage because that can mean a lot of things. Now, sometimes you need to have a verb that, that's broad and covers multiple things. So you just don't end up with an explosion of similar use cases, but, but try to be as specific and clear as we can. So here's a handful of examples of 
fairly good use case names. I want to reserve a rental car or print an invoice or check flight status. You know, those are all things that, that uh, make it very clear what the goal is. Some less good examples. Um, enter the PIN. As I suggested, that's really just a step in a process. It's not a use case. You'd never say, I want to enter my PIN, and that's your goal. Um, submit form 37. Well, are you going to have 37 of those or maybe more because you've got a lot of different forms? Maybe we need to generalize that and make it a little more abstract uh, to submit a series of forms. Process deposit. Process is a vague term that could mean many things. Also, both, both process and deposit could be either nouns or verbs, so that could be a little confusing. So this is a good convention for naming use cases, a verb followed by an object. Let's talk a little bit about user stories. As employed on Agile projects, a user story uh, serves as a placeholder for conversations that need to take place. So here's a formal definition of, uh, of a user story from Mike Cohn, who's written a very nice book on this topic. He says it's a short, simple description of a feature told from the perspective of the person who desires the new capability, who's usually a user or customer of the system. So, Unlike a use case that we may go into a fair amount of detail on, the user story serves as a placeholder that reminds us we're going to have to have some conversations later on with the right people at the right time to get the details of that feature and, and what people are trying to do with it. Um, and, and that's an important point, is that and it's a true of use cases as well. You don't need to define all the specifics of your use cases at the very beginning of the project. You want to do them in a kind of just-in-time kind of way. So the approach I like to take with use cases is to kind of identify as many of the use cases as we think might be relevant or user stories and then do a first cut prioritization on those to help you figure out, roughly speaking, what sequence might we decide to implement these in. We might group those by iterations on an Agile project or by releases. And there's no point in detailing out the specifics of either a story or a use case for something you're not going to be working on for six months or a year. Let's Let's just learn enough about it so we can do that first prioritization. And then once we select the, the group of stories or use cases we're going to work on for the immediate future, that's when we're going to start exploring those details. Now, rather than specifying functional requirements, as is typically done for use cases, Agile teams generally elaborate a user story into a set of acceptance tests that collectively describe the story's conditions of satisfaction. Now, I think Thinking about tests at this early stage is an excellent idea for all projects, regardless of, of your development approach. So whether you're taking a traditional approach or an agile approach, yes, absolutely. Start thinking about tests very early. Now, unlike a use case specification, you don't usually, with stories, get into the specifics of how the user imagines interacting with the system to accomplish this outcome. So here's a template that's commonly used as a style for writing user stories. As some type of user, I want to achieve some goal so that, and then why, why is this important? And this is actually a, a very good way to write these. So let's do a quick comparison here of um, a, an example with a use case and a user story and kind of see how the process might vary. You know, there's this mystique that has grown up around use cases and another one around user stories, and, and I just don't see them as being radically different. In the case of uh, creating an invoice, remember that was one of the things we wanted to do with QuickBooks, or at least I want to do, good name for a use case. If we were to craft that same objective in the form of a user story using the little template we just saw, we might say, as a small business owner, I want to create an invoice so that I can bill a customer. This is actually a more informative statement than just create an invoice because it lets us know who the primary stakeholder is who would get this value. And uh, see that I want to phrase? That just fits right in there very naturally in conversation. It's a clue that here comes a task. And we also see the rationale for that so that I can bill a customer. So at this high level, use cases look much like user stories. Both are focused on understanding what different types of users need to accomplish through their interactions with a software system. But the two processes move in different directions from these similar starting points. With use cases, the next step is for the BA to work with user representatives to understand how they imagine that dialogue taking place with the system to perform the use case. And the BA might structure that information according to a, a use case template. I'll show you one in a few minutes. And that use case specification then allows the BA to derive the necessary functional requirements that must be implemented to let a user perform the use case. And a tester can derive the test that can be used to determine if the use case is properly implemented. 
Now, in the case of user stories, each story serves as a starting point for conversations to elaborate and refine the stories, ultimately leading to a set of acceptance tests that stand in place of detailed functional requirements. But in both cases, we're getting the information we need to be sure that we build the right product. So I see them as really being very, uh, very similar in approach, and I, I sometimes get puzzled about these raging debates I see in forums like LinkedIn about you know, use cases versus user stories. I just think there, there's more similarities and differences there. So why is this a good thing? You know, here's some of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about this usage-centric approach to requirement solicitation. And notice, I don't say requirements gathering, because that, to me, suggests that you're just not collecting them somewhere. I use the term requirement solicitation to recognize that that finding out about requirements is partly a collection process, partly a discovery process, and partly an invention process. So it's, a, it's more than just collecting things. So traditional elicitation activities often emphasize system features. But in contrast, the use case approach emphasizes user goals or objective. It's that usage-centric approach. So in one uh, sense, this is valuable because we're employing the user's terminology. We're talking about their business. And in fact, if you write a use case and the user who reads it doesn't really understand it, there's something wrong because they should be able to relate to your use cases in a pretty, free, pretty straightforward way. This is a way for us to reveal the requirements that have to be implemented for users to get the job done. It's also going to help the analysts better understand the application domain because we're not just talking about features to build for some mysterious reason, we're talking about things people need to do that'll lead us to figure out what those features are. Many of you have probably worked on a project at some point where people said they needed certain functionality and it was dutifully implemented and then no one ever used it. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. And I hate that, that drives me nuts. You know, you, you spend a lot of effort trying to build that functionality that no one uses. But the use case approach helps you avoid getting lots of extra requirements that maybe seemed like a good idea at the time, but they don't add value or help people accomplish specific user tasks. Again, I stress the value of early test development. This is a, a really good way to, to start testing your software early. I know I said that three times, but that's because I think it's really important. And this also helps us set the implementation priorities on the set of functional requirements we come up with. The high priority re functional requirements are related to the high priority use cases or stories. And a use case could be high priority because it's a core function of the system. Maybe it'll be used frequently or by a lot of users. Perhaps it was requested by one of your most important user classes, or it could be required for compliance with some business rule or government regulation. Now, use cases are great for many, but not all types of projects. They work terrific for uh, end-user applications of just about any sort, and such as business automation projects, any place where you can see the user interacting with the system to try to get something done. Websites are a good example of that. People sometimes think about, well, what can we put on our website? Nobody cares what you can put on your website. They care what they can do at your website or get from your website. So that's uh, a, a right there a very good example of taking a usage-centric rather than a feature-centric approach. Uh, use cases are also very well suited for uh, kiosks and other devices that people have to interact with. But they're not as useful for, for example, real-time systems. Uh, and the example I think of here is like a complex highway intersection. Uh, you've got turn signals and multiple lanes and lights and buttons that pedestrians can press and lights for them to look at and all sorts of things. But there's really not very many use cases. You know, if you're a driver, if, if the user class is driver, then you really have the use, two use cases. You want to make a turn or you want to go straight through the light. Uh, you would never have a use case that says stop at the light because that's not something you want to do. That doesn't provide value to you. If you're a pedestrian, you have one use case, which is to cross the street. But that's not enough information for a developer to figure out all the code I have to write for something like that. So at an alternative technique for those kinds of applications is to take an event-driven approach, where we think about the external events that could take place that the system has to respond to. Those could be things like uh, sensors in the road that detect a vehicle, cameras that see a vehicle coming, buttons a pedestrian can press over and over and over again to try to cross the street and that sort of thing. So event-driven approaches are better for real-time systems, usually instead of use cases. Computationally intensive systems and business analytics, those kinds of applications, aren't uh, as valuable, um, use cases aren't as valuable for those because the complexity is not so much in the interaction, the complexity is in what's going on under the hood. So that doesn't really reveal much about those kinds of requirements. So 
So I mentioned this idea of uh, actors versus users. So let me talk a bit about that. User classes are groups of people or even non-human users who receive services from the system. Actors are roles that those people can play with respect to the system. You know, something outside the system that interacts with it to get something done. So users are real, but actors are abstractions. Uh, and the way I think about this is that if you're an actual user or a member of a particular user class, you've got some hats available that you can put on that say, uh, what, what kind of a role are you performing at that moment with respect to the system? Now, sometimes members of one user class can perform several different actor roles at various times. For example, uh, a bank customer is one of several user classes for a banking application. And a bank customer might need to do a variety of things with the system at various times. You know, maybe they're the account owner and need to do account stuff. Or maybe a bank customer is applying for a loan, so they're a loan applicant. And then they put on their hat one day that says, I'm a depositor. So maybe they can deposit a check into an account that they aren't the owner for. So those are all uh, actor roles uh, with different names that a particular bank customer might function as with respect to the system from time to time. In other situations, members of multiple user classes can take on the same actor roles at various times. On the chemical tracking system that I worked on at Kodak, we had multiple user classes, chemists, technicians, and so forth, all of whom were permitted to request new chemicals from the stockroom. But as far as the system was concerned, whenever they're interacting with the use case to, to request a chemical, then those, those jobs descriptions, those user classes, all blur together and the system just says, oh, you're an authorized chemical requester? Sure, let's do some chemical requester things. So it's a many-to-many -many relationship between user classes and actors. Another pair of terms that comes up is uh, the relationship between scenarios and use cases. And we can think of a scenario in a couple of ways. We can think of it as being one specific path through a use case. Um, a particular uh, execution of the use case, an instance that, uh, that has certain properties. Uh, so another way to think about that is uh, as a story, a story about a specific instance of executing the use case, and you might have, instead of just this abstraction, you might have um, identified actual users and specific data to kind of make it more real. Now each case, each use case, typically contains multiple scenarios. Okay, a scenario is less abstract than a use case. It's a little more specific, a little more detailed, a little more real. So a use case encompasses multiple scenarios. It could be success scenarios, or they could be multiple uh, failure modes that we have to worry about. So uh, we, we need to explore all of those. For each use case, we need to think about the various pathways uh, that someone might want to accomplish an outcome. They've got this idea in mind. They interact with the system to choose a particular pathway, and if all goes well, then they reach their goal. But we also have to be aware of possible failure modes or exceptions and think about how we can detect those, prevent them, and handle them if necessary. So let me tell you just very briefly how I approached this on the, the real chemical tracking system project. I started by working with a, a group of chemists, and I said, what are some things you and your colleagues would need to do with the chemical tracking system? And they said things like, well, I need to place an order for a chemical. I need to receive an, a chemical or return the wrong chemical that was delivered. I want to view an order stored in the system. Uh, I need to change an order. You know, all the sorts of things you might do with a system like that. And each of those became a candidate use case. So we held a series of uh, weekly two or two and a half hour elicitation workshops. I put each use case on a flip chart. So that's what this big box represents as a flip chart. So this is a very simple case to view an order stored in the system. So we make a note of which actor cares about this. It's the chemical requester and how often they might have to use it. This gives us a very early idea of capacity planning and throughput and load. Now we realize that there are some things that need to be true before a user can perform a certain use case, and these are called preconditions. The system has to test whether those preconditions are true, and if they are not, it shouldn't even let the user attempt the use case. You've probably been in situations where you started to do something on the, on the computer with some application, and you get partway through the activity, and then all of a sudden it says, oh, you can't do that. We, we can't finish that for you. And your response is, well, you knew that five minutes ago. Why are you wasting my time with this? So that's a matter of not testing preconditions to let somebody uh, go, um, start something only if they have a, at least a theoretical possibility of finishing it. So in this case, we discovered that uh, one precondition is the system has to contain orders. If there's nothing in the database, there's no point in letting someone try to do a query. 
also we realized, hmm, we better know who the user is because we, you can only see your own orders. So we've, we came up with some rules around that. So there's some preconditions. And then we also have some post conditions, which describe what's true at the successful conclusion of the use case. And again, in this case, it's a very trivial outcome where we've shown you the order details. So I split the uh, two parts of the flip chart into uh, actor actions and system responses and then I would have a conversation with the people in this workshop to try to understand how they would envision this dialogue taking place. So I might ask them, well, well how would you imagine interacting with the chemical vacuum systems to view an order? And someone said, well, I'll just enter the order number I want to see. I wrote that on a post-it note, stuck it up under the actor actions column. And then I would say, okay, so um, what should the system do? And someone said, well, if it finds the order and number and it's my order, then it should show me the order details. And that's really the end of the conversation. That, in this trivial case, is the complete dialogue that leads to satisfying the post conditions. That's what post conditions are for, because our, our steps in the use case need to lead to satisfying the post conditions. You know, we have to get done. Now, this is what's called the normal flow, the main success scenario, the happy path, the main flow, the main course, many terms that are used to describe this default or most common way the use case will work. But we also need to explore alternative cases. So I would ask, well, are there any other ways that you might envision uh, interacting with the, the uh, system to see an order? And somebody said, well, I don't always remember my order number, so I want to select them from a list of my orders. That's the same goal. It doesn't change the use case. It's viewing an order. The post conditions are the same. You've seen the order details displayed, but it's an alternative path. That's called an alternative flow. It's just another way to accomplish the same outcome. We also have to worry about things that could go wrong. What if you enter an order number, but it doesn't exist? What should the system do? So we want to think of all of these exceptions and figure out how the system ought to respond to them. Well, we're just going to show you an error message. And so we do this exploration for all of the normal pathways we can think of as well as all of the exception pathways. And this gives us a lot of information that we can use to turn into um, what, what developers are going to have to implement, implement to make that happen. So here's the process I followed. We have these workshops and after the workshop the business analyst, in this case me, I was working with a couple of colleagues as well, also functioning as BAs, we take these flip charts back to our office and start writing up use case descriptions using this template I'll show you in just a moment. Then I'd start deriving the functional requirements from those use cases by thinking about what functionality do we have to implement to let this happen. And I wrote, the, wrote those up in the form of a structured software requirement specification. So I'm growing that knowledge layer by layer, chunk by chunk, as a result of the use, use case explorations. I also would start writing those test cases that I've talked about. We would maybe draw some analysis models like data flow diagram or state transition diagram or sequence diagram or something to help visualize part of uh, how this process would work. Along the way, we identified relevant business rules that were going to affect the use case, and we'd start growing a data dictionary with terms of, for data objects and data structures that we were going to have to deal with. Now, one of the great powers of having these tests uh, available at this point is I can map the tests against my set of requirements that I'm developing and verify the requirements. And every time I do this, I find errors. I find requirements that are not there in order to execute a particular test. I find tests that are unnecessary or can't be executed. Uh, or, or, or just aren't, don't have to be there because of the set of requirements that we come up with. So by using these tests to verify the requirements, to verify the models, we come to a much better shared vision of what we're going to have uh, when we're done with this project. So this worked extremely well in the chemical tracking system and on other projects I've used it on as well, and I was really sold on the power of the technique. I'm not going to spend much time on this, just wanted to show you that there, there are such things as use case templates that have categories into which you can store these various chunks of information about preconditions, postconditions, alternative flows and exceptions and so forth. Now you don't have to fill out the complete template necessarily, you don't fill it out from top to bottom, it's just a structure that you can use to accumulate information as you encounter it and to help you uh, think about stuff that's not filled in. Like, you know, maybe you go along and you don't have any assumptions filled in. Well, perhaps there are some assumptions we should think about. So a template like this is a very helpful structure. I'm a big fan of thoughtful templates. So one of the classic examples used to illustrate use cases is uh, an ATM. So we'll use that as well. I've been using this example for many years, and it's something we can all relate to. The use case is to withdraw cash, very straightforward. 
the uh, actor of interest is the account owner, and we'll have a short description as part of our use case. The user withdraws a specific amount of cash from an account. We have a trigger condition, something that initiates the system's uh, awareness that you want to do this. So there's maybe you select a withdrawal action from a menu. We've found some preconditions. You have to be logged into the ATM or you can't get money out of it. You have to have an account with money in it, and the ATM better have money in it. And I'm sure there are more, but those are enough for now. And then we have some very obvious post conditions that you've got the amount of money that you wanted, and some slightly less obvious post conditions, like your account balance is reduced by the amount you took out plus any relevant fees. And business rules would tell us how to calculate those fees. And in addition, here's one post condition that's critical that you've reduced the ATM cash balance by the amount taken out, but no user will ever tell you that. So working with users alone is not likely to give you all of the information relevant to a use case. We're going to have to deal with other experts who know that, oh, yeah, there's some behind-the-scenes stuff here that's important. So it's not just all about the user interaction. Priority is another attribute, and the priority is high because the only reason you put money into an ATM or into a bank is so that you can take money back out of the bank. Now, the one thing other, uh, that people often agree on about the normal flow is how to write that, and it's a, typically written as a numbered list of steps where you can see the system and actor interacting in order to get something done. And uh, in this case, the first thing that would happen is the system might display your accounts, and then the account owner, and I like to actually use the name of the actor here instead of just saying user, let's say the account owner, because that's the specific actor we're talking about, chooses the account they want to take money out of, the system asks the user to choose the amount they want, maybe shows a list of possible values, you select one from that list, and the system says I can do that, and it gives you some cash, and you take the cash and you walk away happy. It's the happy path, you're done, you've successfully completed the use case. So this is the way the normal flow would work, but remember we also have to think about alternative flows, and the most obvious alternative flow here I think is that you don't want one of the pre-displayed amounts, you want some custom amount like $320. That's not going to show up on the list of options probably, so you have to have a capability so you can enter a custom amount. And with alternative flows, they often are branches that would take place at some point in the normal flow, so we want to describe where would we take that branch, what happens that's different from the, the main flow, and then where would we rejoin the main flow to complete the execution of the use case. We also have to think about exceptions, and there are a bunch of them that could come up. Every ATM I've personally interacted with only had $20 bills in it, so if the amount I want is not a multiple of 20, it's not going to work. I tried this once on my ATM. I told it I wanted $127 just to see what it said, and it correctly said, sorry, I can't do that. It's got to be a multiple of 20. There's some rule that says you can only get so much of your very own money out of your very own account per day. And so that's a business rule that the software has to enforce. If you try to ask for more, it's going to have to do something different. Suppose you ask for more money than you have, or suppose you ask for more money than is in the ATM. This actually happened to me once. So I said, okay, give me how much you said you have, but it gave me a different amount. So that was kind of a weird conversation with the bank people. So with exceptions, what we do is we indicate the step number in a flow, either the normal flow or an alternative flow. They can both have exceptions. Where that exception could take place, and let's describe how the system is supposed to handle it. You know, sometimes you can come up with a way to recover from an exception. Other times you just have to say, sorry, we can't complete that, and then you have to you know, roll the system back to an appropriate state. So let me say a few words here about use cases and functional requirements. There are two schools of thought here. Some methodologists regard use cases as being the representation of functional requirements, and they regard creating a functional requirements list or a software requirement specification as unnecessary. However, I have seen too many organizations get into trouble by trying to rely solely on use cases as a requirements representation. The developers had a lot of questions because there was just a lot of detailed information missing. So I consider that use cases represent a way to reveal the functional requirements. They represent the user's view of the system, and the analyst then will have to translate that user's view into a set of individual functional requirements, which is the technical or developer's view of the system. Now, this happens regardless of whether you choose to document those functional requirements or not. If you hand use cases or user stories off to your developers and say, go talk to some people and figure this out and then build it, they're still going through the same thought process that I've shown here with this arrow called analyst of saying, okay, what functionality do I have to implement? They're just doing that 
on the fly in their brain. And that can work fine in many cases, but my personal preference is to think about writing down some of that. I have a philosophy that the cost of recording knowledge is small compared to the cost of acquiring knowledge. So it doesn't bother me to write some of that stuff down for, uh, for future reference or for other people to uh, be aware of. So I, I see the user requirements in the form of use cases primarily helping us understand user needs so that we can figure out what to tell the developers to build. So here are some examples of how you might study various parts of the use case that would lead to certain software functional requirements that will enable the correct system behavior to take place. Thinking back again to our ATM example, you know, one other thing about preconditions, preconditions in a use case say these things must be true before we can carry out the use case, but they never tell you what do you do if they aren't true. Somebody has to figure that out. So we might look at a precondition and say, oh, the system shall verify that the account is set up for ATM withdrawals. And if it turns out it's not, then we better have some other requirements to say, what do you do if it isn't? Do you give the user the option to set that up or tell them what they need to do to set it up or just kick them out and spit their card out? What do you do if the precondition isn't satisfied? We need to, to deduce those requirements. The requirements that come out of the steps and the flow are pretty straightforward, and you, you really don't probably need to, to duplicate all those. You might have a functional requirement that would look like this, though. The system shall display a list of standard withdrawal amounts. The user shall select one of these amounts or other, and then more things would happen if they chose other. The post conditions. The system shall reduce the total cash remaining in the ATM by the amount of the withdrawal. You know, the fees don't apply to the amount of money left in the ATM, just to the amount of money left in your account. And then we have to look at pertinent business rules. Uh, for example, if I go for my business to the bank and get a, uh, make a deposit and I get my receipt, it doesn't show my balance because that's their, their business policy. It says uh, the system shall print the available balance on the receipt unless the account is a business account, in which case it doesn't. So um, these are the white box details that make the use case work. You know, the use case provides a high level view of how the actor does the job of the system. And you can detail the use case to fully describe all these system activities, or you can develop these functional requirements as a separate step. There's another reason why this is a good idea, and that the way the information is organized is quite different between a use case and a typical software requirement specification. Here we have the major components of a use case. We've got preconditions, a normal flow, zero or more alternatives, zero or more exceptions, and so forth. Now, an SRS, which is you know, a list of functional requirements, is organized in a different way. And the functional requirements that the analyst derives from these various parts of the use case would logically be uh, appearing in different locations of the SRS um, in a way that makes it easy for the developer to see what goes together. For example, it makes sense to the developer to see a description of an error condition or an exception right next to the point in the normal flow where the error can take place instead of in a little package like this somewhere in the use case that they have to then assemble and see how the pieces fit together. So uh, I think many cases developers will find a structured hierarchical list of requirements like this easier to decipher and implement than having to go through the process with the use case and figure out what all those chunks are and, and how they fit together. But what I suggest you do is work with your developers to see how they find the information most accessible and most useful rather than just doing it in the way that you think is going to be useful to them. Let's collaborate on these things. Let's work together to communicate in the most effective and efficient way we can. So I know I've given you just a whirlwind tour here of some of the basic ideas of use cases. I hope this helps clarify some of these points that people sometimes struggle with. And the reason I think that methods like the use case technique are so valuable is that they help us reduce the surprise factor that happens at the end of way too many software projects. Software surprises, in my experience, are almost never good news. I I've never had the kind of surprise where someone said to me, oh, Carl, the system is so much better than I ever imagined. How can I possibly repay you? I've never had that conversation, although I think that should be our goal. So thank you for your attention here, and uh, if you take away just one thought from this presentation, keep in mind that without high-quality requirements, software is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So let's go back to Michael for some closing comments. Well, thanks, Carl. As I mentioned earlier, we have the results from the Global Knowledge 2015 Salary Study, and it reinforces a lot of what Carl has been talking about today. Uh, the idea of getting closer to the customer and building things that works for them is clearly good for job security. 
And we see that with high demand around business analysis, business intelligence, salaries are great for business technologists, cloud for business, IT service management, customer service, project managers are all high, and as you might expect, analytics, big data, all these are all good places to be for job security and ability to move up. We also found in the study that organizations are looking for a lot of help, mainly analyzing building out um, the workforce transformation plans that they need to change, but really plan is um, the right word for an individual or an organization. This is a great opportunity for everybody. If you're an individual contributor, talk to your manager and your global knowledge representative to build out a roadmap about what you can do to add more value into your business training and expand in your organization. Or if you're in a role where you help drive business transformation, lean on global knowledge services. Um, consider our consulting services, analyzing skill gaps, building plans, managing the change, and ultimately closing the gap with learning services. My contact information is on the slide, and I'd look forward to answering any questions you might have. Once again, thank you, Carl. It's been a fantastic opportunity. Back to you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we've got time for just a few questions here. If you do have questions, feel free to submit those in the box, and I'll, I'll get to as many as we can. One question is, uh, would you consider user requirements comparable to what we state as acceptance criteria in user stories? I would say no. The uh, user stories themselves are the user requirements. Okay, because those are talking about what users are trying to do with the system. So user stories and use cases are comparable and both ways to explore and represent user requirements. What we state as acceptance criteria or acceptance tests in user stories would correspond more to uh, what are traditionally developed as functional requirements from the, um, from the use case. So if you recall with use cases, I was saying you might detail those into the functionality that has to be implemented. Um, so that's what I mean by functional requirements. Um, with you, when you're writing user stories, that's not always done. Instead, people might write acceptance tests, which are really just another way of looking at the same information. It's, it's not semantically different in terms of, of really the information that you're recording. It's a matter of saying, in one case, let me communicate what we need to build. In the other case, let me communicate a way to tell if we've built what we needed to build. Okay, they're both valid ways to represent that knowledge, uh, but they're complementary. And the power of doing both, or really, let me say it the other way, the limitation of only creating one of those views of that information is that you must believe it. You have to trust it. It's the only thing you have. But if you create both views, if you create both the requirements to say, go build this, and preferably in a different thought process, even more preferably a totally different brain, let's have somebody look at the same starting point information and come up with tests, then we can say, here's how we would tell if we built the right thing, and you can compare those and look for disconnects. That's a very powerful uh, approach. So the, that's how I think about that. Uh, let's see here. Um, I just got a tiny little window I can scroll through here. Uh, so there's a question here that says, I'm working on a website that necessitates uh, implementing coding best practice, so the website is web accessibility compliant. A lot of people want to keep that in mind. Uh, there's a finite set of guidelines regarding accessibility, so where would these requirements fall? User requirements, functional or non-functional? And it's probably going to be in some of all of those. Uh, you're probably actually starting with business rules, which are the accessibility uh, you know, policies that you're going back to. And what you need to do is look at those and say, now, uh, that mostly that's not going to affect user requirements because the tasks people are trying to accomplish are the same, uh, whether they, you know, require accessibility features or not. Mostly those are probably going to be functional requirements that say uh, we're going to provide certain functionality so that people who, you know, have uh, accessibility limitations can perform these tasks, but the tasks are the same. So most of that's likely to be in, uh, in the functional category where you're thinking of what functionality do I have to implement um, to make it work, you know, uh, say by, by speech as opposed to by people typing in a keyboard. But there will also be non-functional requirements that you have to think about, such as, you know, color selections and things like that. That's not really functionality, that's more user interface design kinds of things. So that's a, that's a big uh, problem, but I can just touch on it uh, very quickly there. So let's see here. Um, all right, what's the biggest challenge in leveraging the use case approach that you have faced in your career, and how would you handle it uh, differently if it happened again? Well, 
um, like any new technique, when we started using use cases on the chemical tracking system, we only had some you know, learning about them from some reading. There weren't really any books written at that time. Some conference talks I'd gone to. So we were fumbling around a little bit. We were just trying to, to grope around and try to see how to make it work. And it took us a, a few false starts and some practice to learn from each other and, and see how to do it. So today that shouldn't be a problem. I would say that your, your best bet uh, to try to avoid those kinds of challenges is, tra is training. Uh, you know, we've done a little bit of that here today, but only in, you know, about an hour. So if you can take a, a course on use cases, even better, if you could get some of your users to go through it's like, like an e-learning course that I have on use cases to get the basic concepts and practices and maybe go through a practice elicitation session together before you do it for real, I think that will help you an awful lot. Well, I think we're out of time here, so thank you very much for, for uh, joining us, and I uh, hope you're, you're successful with your use case efforts. Okay, thank you, Carl, for a very informative presentation. I'm seeing a lot of positive comments here, so I know everyone enjoyed it. Thank you all for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. That concludes today's event. I hope you have a great day.